Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sankhang Namasami So, welcome everyone to session five of our course. Today we are talking about Upalavana, the second chief disciple of the Buddha, the female counterpart of Mahamoggalana and also the nun foremost in psychic powers. So I will share my screen and then we can start and have a look at what we're doing today. So, um, so today, firstly, we will have a look at her life story in the Dhammapada commentary. So that's quite a late text, but I just wanted to give a brief overview over her life before we, um, jump in detail into uh, her stories. And then we are going to read an early text. So actually Upalavana has two early texts in our sources. One is her poem in the Terigata, which we are not going to look at today. And the other one is uh, her sutta in the Bhikkhuni Samyutta. And this sutta exists in three versions. Uh, one Pali version and two Chinese versions. And because I'm assuming that most people will be familiar with the Pali version, we are going to read from the Chinese. But actually those suttas are all, because they're parallels and they're all really, really similar, it doesn't really matter too much which we are reading. But I thought it would be nicer to, to read one that is not so widely known. And um, then we are going to look at later texts, the Vinaya texts about Upalavana. And in almost all Buddhist traditions, Upalavana is very much associated with stories about sexual assault, stories about rape, stories about sexual harassment. So this is something that we cannot avoid looking at when we talk about Upalavana. So today will be a little bit of like a heavy topic talking about um, yeah, sexual assault. And connected with that in most traditions are also the rules about staying in the wilderness for Bikunis or not staying in the wilderness for Bikunis. So that's something that we should also look at um, when we talk about Upalavana. And of course, the rules for staying in the wilderness, um, they are not, um, these are not minor rules. I mean, it, it looks like they're minor rules in the Vinaya, but they have a huge impact on the ability of women to practice the Dhamma properly. Because if you cannot go into a quiet place, a secluded place, and um, at the time of the Buddha, or at the time, even the centuries after the Buddha, uh, that would have meant going to the wilderness because the cities, they're crowded, um, there are too many people, and there's noise. Um, and of course, back then, Kutis weren't insulated the way they're insulated now. People, did, people did, didn't have triple glazed windows. So if you're in the city or in a village, then you're really in the middle of the noise. So not being able to go to the wilderness really impacts on women's abilities to practice the higher stages of the path, to actually develop samadhi and to actually develop um, the, you know, the, uh, the path to arahanship and to get the fruits of the holy life that they should be getting. So the rule about, about not staying in the wilderness are actually quite, that's quite a huge restriction on the bhikkhunis. So that's what we are going to look at today as well. Um, but before we uh, start with all the heavy topics, um, let's have a look at her life story. So I will be reading from uh, the Dhammapada commentary or actually from a text that was written by Venerable Veraguda Saradatero. Uh, he translated the Dhammapada in the book Treasury of Truth, and he added the commentarial stories. But I think I think this is not a proper translation of the commentary. It's just like a summary that he gave, but I think it's good enough, and it's a nice and short text. So um, 
I thought it was suitable for our course just to get an overview over her life. So the story begins. Upa Lavana was born in a wealthy family and was named after the lotus flower, Upa Lavana. So Upala is actually the name for the blue lotus and Vanna just means beauty. Um, and of course, some people might know in the later tradition, it was said that Upalavana actually had the color of the blue lotus flower, so that her skin color was blue. Um, in the early text, there's no indication whatsoever to, to say that there was anything unusual about her skin color. So I think we can safely assume that that is a later legend. Um, but the lotus flower obviously was very popular back then, so naming a girl or a woman after the lotus flower um, was probably an obvious choice back then. So anyway, when she came of age, proposals for marriage came from all quarters and the harassed father did not wish to offend any suitor by a refusal. To the father, ordination in the noble sangha was the only solution. The daughter to her destiny agreed. Upon being ordained, she was kept in charge of the convocation room, i.e. the oppositor hall, where the nuns assembled for the confession of lapses. She had to tend to the lamps. She observed that the light was sustained by the wick and the oil. Sometimes the light goes out by going short of either or by a gust of wind. So life was due to comic force. This kept her thinking till she, had, till she became an arahant. She remembered her former life. It was while living alone in a forest, a young shepherd named Nanda, a kinsman of hers, got infatuated with her and committed a sexual offense as soon as she returned from a round of arms. Coming from the noonday glare to the dark cave where her abode was, she could not see and hence she was taken by surprise despite her protest. He committed the dire deed and was immediately born in the hell when the earth yawned and swallowed the foolish young man. He was, however, dead before the yawning of the earth. It was after this incident, the Blessed One prohibited the female, son the female disciples of the Noble Sangha from living in isolation in the forest. Not long afterwards, the Buddha addressing the monks declared Upalavana Mahatiri was foremost for psychic power as Venerable Maha Moggallana was among the Bhikkhu Arahats. So <clears throat> here we get a little introduction into a story and the association uh, with the sexual assault stories. And also that she was the cause for laying down this rule about not living in the forest for Bhikkhunis. Um, but obviously this is a much later text. So before we go into detail in, into those texts, I just want to show you her sutta from the Bhikkhuni Samyutta, which uh, shows a completely different picture, of course, otherwise I wouldn't be showing it. Um, so, as I mentioned, this is from the Chinese version of the text. And the sutta begins. Thus have I heard. One time, the Buddha was staying at Savati in Jeta's Grove and Atapindika's Park. Then Upalavanna Bhikkhuni was staying at Savati in the King's Park among the Bhikkhuni Sangha. Early in the morning, she put on her robe, took her bowl, and entered Savati on arms round. When she had eaten, she returned to the monastery, put away her, her robe and bowl, washed her feet, took her sitting cloth, put it on her shoulder, and went into the Andavana. She sat under a tree and entered into mental unification for the day. So here we have the introduction, which is setting the scene for this sutta. So we, firstly, we see that Upalavana is staying in a place called the King's Park which is a Bhikkhuni monastery. And that's interesting because the King's Park is mentioned very, very often in the Sanskrit and Chinese sources as a place for Bhikkhunis, as a Bhikkhuni monastery. And it doesn't occur at all ever in the Pali tradition, to my knowledge. So to my knowledge, the Pali tradition doesn't actually preserve the names of any monasteries of the Bhikkhunis. So in the Pali tradition, it's not actually clear if the Bhikkhunis had their own places to stay or if they just stayed um, in the monks' monasteries, like in, in a separate area of the monks' monasteries. But in the Chinese uh, sources, it's quite clear that they had their own places and the King's Park is the most famous of them. And um, then we also see she's going on arms round. She's doing that alone, uh, which is the usual way of doing arms round in the early texts. 
So in the early texts, we usually see monks and nuns going in arms alone or in small groups, such as maybe a teacher bikuni with her students, but we never see the entire Sangha going together. Uh, so if like in modern times, when, when we think of arms round, usually we think of the Thai style of doing it, where the entire Sangha of one monastery goes together and they all go out in one line and go through the village and come back together. But that's uh, not how the early Sangha did it. So in the early Sangha, people were much more independent and they much more did their own things. Um, and so we, we see Upalavana doing it also this way. And then she also goes into the forest alone. So here's an, the forest is mentioned, the forest that is mentioned is the Andavana. And this uh, mention also is very significant. And I think it's significant for two reasons. The first one is, uh, the name Andavana is usually or very often translated as the blind man's grove. Uh, but literally it means the, like Anda means dark and Vana means forest. So the dark forest. And Vansuchatu, for example, translates as Mirkwood. Um, for Germans, Germans would translate as black forest, I think. Um, and um, yeah, anyway, so she's not going into some lovely, uh, beautiful mango grove. She's actually going really into like the deepest possible seclusion into the dark forest. And she's going there alone, as we see. And the second reason why the Andavana is so significant is um, because there is a long tradition in almost in, in all Buddhist schools that associates Bikunis with the Andavana. And in the Mahishasaka Vinaya, which is a Chinese Vinaya, there is a story preserved, an origin story to one of the rules, one of the Pachitya rules, which tells us that the Andavana used to be a property that belonged to the Bikunis. So, um, and, and also in all traditions, we, we regularly see Bikunis going there. So clearly they made, made good use of their property. And even, even like in the Vinaya, even the nuns who are misbehaving nuns regularly go to the Andavana and do meditation there. So when we see, um, when we're going to talk about Tulananda, for example, those of you who know Tulananda is the foremost nun of misbehavior. So that's why I thought it would be nice to have a session on her in our, co in our course of foremost Bikunis, because she is foremost in misbehavior. And when we talk about her, we will see that she's also um, doing meditation in the Andavana, as do many other monks and nuns, uh, many other nuns, not monks. Um, and in that story in the Vinaya, the Mahishasaka Vinaya, which, uh, which tells that the bhikkhunis uh, had this property, it is said that eventually the bhikkhunis exchanged that property with a property of the monks that was situated in the, in the city and that had a uh, um, a building built on it. So when I read that, uh, I had this kind of insight moment where I realized actually for the first time that when the wilderness rules were imposed on the nuns, um, that wasn't just a way of controlling the movement of the nuns, and it wasn't just a way of securing prestige for the male sangha, because obviously if you um, create obstacles for the nuns to properly practice dhamma, then there won't be uh, so many highly developed nuns, and also if the nuns, if the monks are the only ones who can practice ascetic practices and do like the real stuff in the forest, whereas all the nuns live together with the lay people in the village, then obviously there would be like lay people would perceive a huge difference in in respect and um, in status uh, between the two sanghas, and the monks' status would be elevated and the nuns uh, would be reduced if they can't do the proper practice anymore, and if they're not per perceived as proper renunciates anymore. Um, but then I realized it's not only about prestige and it's not only about controlling the nuns. Uh, when the nuns no longer could stay in the wilderness, the monks also gained access to a lot of those uh, good properties uh, that, you, that, that previously belonged to the nuns. So there was also a material benefit from uh, obstructing nuns from practicing in the wilderness. Uh, and when I read this story about the Andavana, that's actually the first time that I thought about that. So that's why I think the references to the Andavana are really um, very significant here. And anyway, the story then continues. Then Mara, the evil one, thought, now the recluse Gotama is staying at Savati in Jeta's Grove and at the Pindika's Park. 
Upa Lavana Bikuni is staying at Savati in the King's Park among the Bikuni Sangha. Early in the morning, she put on her robe, took her bowl, and entered Savati on arms round. When she had eaten, she returned to the monastery, put away her robe and bowl, washed her feet, took her sitting cloth, put it on her shoulder, and went into the Andavana. She is sitting under a tree and has entered into mental unification for the day. I now go there and make trouble. Then he transformed himself into a young, handsome man, went to Upalavana Bikuni and spoke a verse. You're staying under this blossoming sala tree, alone, without a companion. Don't you fear evil men? Then Upalavana Bikuni thought, who is this that wants to frighten me? Is it a human? Is it a non-human? Is it a rapist? Having thought this, she realized, this must be Mara, the evil one, who just wants to disturb me. Then she spoke a verse. Even if a hundred thousand men, all rapists, like you, evil Mara, came here to me, they could not stir a hair on my body. I don't fear you, evil Mara. So here we have Mara challenging the bikuni and playing with that fear um, of being alone in the forest and there being the possibility of the nuns being attacked. Um, so he is a basic, basically whatever, like when the wilderness rules were imposed on the bikunis, this is the reason that is given uh, for the protection of the bikunis because they should fear evil men. But what we see in this sutta is that this is actually the thinking of Mara. This is not the thinking of uh, enlightenment and wisdom. Um, so in this sutta, it becomes very clear that people who speak like this uh, just parrot what Mara would be saying. And Upalavana makes it very clear. I mean, at this point, she's an Arahant. She's the foremost in psychic powers. Even a hundred thousand men cannot do anything to her. She's independent. She's strong. She's, she has totally overcome fear. Nobody can do anything to her because she is the foremost in psychic powers. So, but Mara doesn't let it go at this point. He speaks another verse. I will now enter your belly and stay inside your organs. If I dwell be between your two eyebrows, you can't see me. Then Upalavana Bikuni spoke another verse. My mind has great might. The psychic powers are well developed. The great feathers have been released. I don't fear you, evil Mara. I have expelled the three pollutants, which are the roots of fear. I dwell in a fearless state. I don't fear Mara's army. Free from all the light, apart from all ignorance, having realized extinguishment, I live at peace with chains destroyed. I know you, evil Mara. You should vanish and leave. Then Mara, the evil one, thought, Upalavana Bikuni knows my mind. Worried and sad, he disappeared from sight. So Upalavana makes a very strong statement here. She states how powerful she is, how independent she is. Um, and yeah, let's count how many times she, she, she says that she is not fearful. So here she says, I don't fear you. Then she says another time, I don't fear you. Then she says she has expelled the three pollutants, which are the root of fear. Then she says she's fearless. And again, she doesn't fear Mara. So I don't know how she could have made it any clearer that men cannot attack her, that she's so powerful, so, so independent, um, that nobody can do anything to her. And when she goes into the wilderness, there's nothing that can happen to her. And we see this is the nun speaking in her own voice. This is the testimony of an early bikuni and her attitudes and how she perceives going into the wilderness. And still, even though she, she could not have made it any clearer, she is the one who in all of the later traditions is associated with rape and associated with sexual assault. So, um, this is obviously a very strange situation. So we're going to have a look at these later texts and then see what happened and see if we can find an explanation um, why all these rape stories are associated with her, even though she herself in her own words, in her own testimony makes it very clear that um, she doesn't need to fear being raped. So now we're having a look at those later stories, the Vinaya rules about Upalavana and sexual assault. 
and we are going to start with the Pali version. And in the Pali version, this uh, story is found in the Bhikkhu Parajika 1. And obviously that is a very strange situation that a story about a Bhikkhuni is found in a Bhikkhu rule. And um, the reason for that is, um, I've mentioned that already in our first session when we talked about the first council and we when we had a look at how the texts were compiled, we know that Bikunis were not present at the first council. We know that they did not represent their own tradition and they did not get the, the chance to collect their own vinaya. So we know that uh, the monks collected a complete vinaya for the monks rule and only col and for the nuns, they did not collect a complete vinaya. They only collected those rules that are not shared with the bhikkhus. So, but Parajika 1, Parajika 1 is actually the first rule of the vinaya. And this is the rule about uh, ha having sexual intercourse. So this rule says that if a monk or nun has sexual intercourse, they have to immediately disrobe, they're no longer a monk or nun. Uh, and technically this is classified as a shared rule. So that's why the nuns don't have their own, uh, their own um, commentary or their own, their own explanatory material on this rule. But actually the, the two rules uh, are significantly different between the monks and the nuns, which then of course is problematic because now the nuns don't have explanations for all the things that are different for them. So for the, monk, for the monks, the rules is if a bhikkhu who has not disrobed, has sexual intercourse even with an animal, then he is parajika. And for the nuns, the, rules are, the rule is if a nun willingly has sexual intercourse even with an animal, she is parajika. So there's no mention of disrobing first, and um, the word willingly is included for the nuns to make it very clear that all kinds of um, sexual coercion or rape or assault are not included under this rule. So as the nuns don't have their own uh, explanatory material, the story about a nun has to be included in the Bhikkhu version. So the story goes as follows. At one time, a young Brahmin had fallen in love with the nun Upalavanna. When Upalavanna had entered the village for alms, he entered her hut and hid himself. After her meal, when she had returned from alms round, Upalavanna washed her feet, entered her hut and sat down on the bed. Then that young Brahmin took hold of her and raped her. She told the nuns what had happened. The nuns told the monks, who, who in turn told the Buddha. There's no offense for one who doesn't consent. So the Buddha again makes it clear because as I mentioned, in the monk's rule, consent isn't mentioned. The word willingly isn't mentioned. So the Buddha has to make it clear again that if you don't consent, uh, there is no offense. You don't break this rule. And we see that the rule about wildernesses is not laid down here in the Pali version, because as I said, this is the bhikkhu vinaya. So of course you cannot lay down this rule uh, because you don't want it to cover the bhikkhus. So for the, in the Pali tradition, the wilderness rule is actually separate from the incident with Upalavanna unlike the other schools. So before we talk about this in more detail, I want to read all the other texts so we can talk about all of them together. And the next text we are looking at is from a school that is called the Dharma Guptaka School. And I'm aware that I haven't given a proper introduction into the vinyas and into the schools. And as we discussed last time, we will probably have a special extra session on Bikuni Vinaya. And then I will explain this in more detail, but for today, I'm, I'm not going to explain this in more detail. And I, and I hope that you can just um, be patient until we have um, the, the other session. So the Dhammaguptaka school is another school. This is the school in which um, monastics still practice nowadays in the Mahayana tradition. And this text is found in a collection that is called the Kandakas. And the Kandakas are um, collections of rules that uh, are also later, later than the Patimoka rules. So we know that this is a later text. Um, and the text says, then Upalavanna Bhikkhuni did walking meditation in the wilderness. The Bhikkhuni's appearance was beautiful. And there was a young Brahmin who, when he saw her, attached his mind to her. Then he grabbed her and wanted to rape her. The Bhikkhuni said, 
Let me go, I'll go to the toilet. He then let her go and Upalavana Bikuni went to the toilet and smeared excrement on her body. The Brahmin got angry and hit her head with a stone so that both her eyes popped out. Upalavana hadn't remembered that she had psychic powers, but later it came to her mind again. Then she flew to the Buddha with her psychic powers and having paid respect with her head at his feet, she stood at one side and the Buddha said, this Bikuni has joyous, joyous faith, her eyes will return as before. Then as he spoke, they returned as before. The Bikuni had doubts, the Buddha said, there is no offense. A Bikuni should not go to the wilderness. So, I think, yeah, there's a lot to say about this story, but as we see, the next one is very, very similar to this one. Uh, so uh, let's read through the next two stories and then talk about everything together. And the next one is from a school that is called the Sarva Sivada School. And uh, the text says, the Buddha was at Savati. At that time, Upalavana Bikuni, before midday, put on her robes, took her bowl and entered the city on arms round. After the meal, she put her sitting cloth on her shoulder and went into the Andavana. She laid out her sitting cloth and sat in half lotus position under a tree. So we see this introductory per, uh, portion is exactly the same, or pretty much exactly the same, a clear copy of her early sutta that we read just now. So there is a clear connection between those two texts and the sutta we read from just now was also from the Savastivada tradition. So uh, it is very clear that when, when, the, when the story here came into being, uh, they were aware of Upalavana Sutta and they copied from that to make it look more authentic. Uh, and even though they were aware of that early Sutta, still the content uh, that they put into this story is basically the exact opposite of that Sutta. So yeah, it's interesting what happened here. And the story continues. Then there was the son of a Brahmin in whose mind craving and attachment towards the bhikkhuni had arisen. He went to the bhikkhuni and said, let's have sex together. Upalavanna bhikkhuni thought, if I oppose him, he'll take me by force. She said to him, wait a little. He asked, why should I wait a little? Then the bhikkhuni with her psychic powers turned the inside of her body outside. So she displayed her organ. The son of a Brahmin said angrily, well, that's disgusting. Then he beat her head with his fist and both her eyes popped out. Another bhikkhuni put her eyes into a water jug and led her to the Buddha. The Buddha said to the bhikkhunis, you should make an asseveration of truth. Upalavana bhikkhuni has, has profoundly joyous faith in the Buddha's Dhamma. She has nothing to purify in regard to the Buddha, the Dhamma or the Sangha. She has nothing to be criticized for in regard to the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. By this truth, let her two eyes become as before. So we see the Buddha um, asked them to make an asseveration of truth, uh, Satcha Kiriya in Pali. So um, just to explain, in case somebody doesn't know what that is, uh, this is a very popular motif in both the early and the later traditions. So we have that in uh, the very late texts, such as the commentaries, for example, in Queen Anoja's story, going, story of her going forth. Queen Anocha was the wife of Mahakapina. And we have it in early texts also, for example, in Angulimala story. So I'm assuming everybody knows Angulimala. He was the bandit who killed uh, a lot of people and who made the finger garland. And he became an arahant. And when he was an arahant, he was full of compassion for all beings. And then one day he saw a woman giving birth and she was having a breech birth. So the baby was stuck. And it seemed like both the woman and the baby were dying. And then the Buddha told him to make an asseveration of truth. Um, because back then it was believed that if you speak a truth, a, a profoundly truthful statement that has a very special power and is able to work a miracle. So the Buddha told uh, Angulimala to say, uh, to say how harmless he is towards all living beings. And so he made that statement and by that truthful statement, the woman and the baby survive. Uh, so this disbelief in the power of speaking a truthful statement um, is very popular among all Buddhist traditions. 
And so here in this case, they use it to uh, restore Upalavana's eyes. So when the Bikunis had carried out this asseveration of truth, her eyes became as before. The Buddha said to the Bikunis, from now on, Bikunis may not stay in the wilderness. If they stay there, they incur a dukkata. A dukkata is a minor offense. And then the last text uh, we are reading is from the Mula Savasivada um, tradition. And it's, it's also very similar to the first two we have read. And it goes as follows. The Buddha was at Rajagaha in the bamboo grove. In this city, there was a prostitute named Upalavanna who made a living by displaying her beauty as a profession. Then a Brahmin came and said, young woman, are you well? Please have sex with me. She replied, do you have money? He answered, no, I don't. The woman said, please go and search for money. Come back later and see me. He answered, I will search. He then went to the south to do business everywhere and acquired 500 gold coins. Then he returned to the woman's place. By then, Upalavanna, relying on the Venerable, Maha, Venerable Mokalana as a spiritual friend, had gone forth, received the full ordination and entertained Arahanship. As it was pleasing to her, she had left Rajagaha and gone to Savati. At that time, the World Honored One had not yet barred Bikunis from staying in the wilderness. Then Upalavanna went to the dark wood. So again, we see the connection to the Andavana here. To sit in meditation in a quiet place, enter into Samadhi and feel the bliss of liberation. The Brahmin took the 500 gold coins, went to Rajagaha and asked the people, where has the woman Upalavanna gone? They answered, she went forth in the Dhamma of the second son and has gone to Savati. When he heard what they said, he went to Jetavana and asked the bhikkhus, noble ones, where is the woman from Rajagaha called Upalavanna now, who has wandered here? They answered, that woman has given up what is against Dhamma and gone forth. She single-mindedly practices inside in the dark wood. Then he went there and addressed her, young woman, Previously, you've spoken truthfully, and now I came here with money. Please have sex with me. She replied, Brahmin, I've given up this sinful, bad profession. It's proper for you to leave now. He replied, young woman, even though you reject me, I won't reject you. You should get up and come. I certainly won't let you go. She replied, which part or limb of my body do you delight in? He answered, I love your eyes. Then she scooped out her two eyes with her supernormal powers and gave them to him. Then the Brahmin thought, this bald renunciate woman can perform such feats, feats of witchcraft. He beat the Bikuni's head with his fist, released her and went away. Then she told the Bikuni Sangha about this incident. The Bikunis told the Bikus and the Bikus told the Buddha. The Buddha thought, because the Bikunis stay in the wilderness, there was this transgression. From now on, Bikunis should not seek seclusion in the dark wood or in the wilderness. If they stay there, they incur a minor offense. So, um, I think it's, it's quite obvious that the last uh, three stories that we have read through are uh, very similar. They have very, very similar motives. They probably stem from a common origin. So in each case, we have a Bikuni, Upala, the Bikuni Upalavanna, she is going into the wilderness, then she is uh, uh, harassed by a man. And uh, through some, in some way or another, uh, her eyes she, are taken out. And at that point, uh, the Brahmin goes away and she, by some means or other, gets to the Buddha and uh, a miracle happens and her eyes return as before. So I think probably this story is quite familiar to most people who know a little bit about the Pali tradition, because in the Pali tradition, we have this story too. The only thing is in our tradition, this is not um, the story of Upalavana. This story is uh, the story of Suba, Suba in Jivaka's mango grove. So Suba has a long, uh, poem in the Telegata where she um, tells this entire story, where she also goes into the wilderness, this mango grove, and uh, a man obstructs her path and tries to convince her to um, 
uh, indulge in various kinds of sense pleasures with her and doesn't want to let her go. And she tries to teach him the Dhamma, but he just doesn't let her go and keeps on praising her eyes. And eventually she pulls out her eye and hands it to him. And he's shocked and disgusted and then backs off at that point. And she goes to the Buddha and also a miracle happens and her eye is restored as before. So we see this story was popular among most of the Buddhist tradition, but this story was not necessarily always attributed to Upalavana. Um, so, um, yeah, what is happening here? Why do so many Buddhist traditions preserve the idea that Upalavana is the one who gets raped in the wilderness or gets sex sexually assaulted in various ways in the wilderness? Um, and um, yeah, why Upalavana specifically in all the stories? And I think, like, it, because especially Upalavana is the one, the one who um, in the early text speaks out and says, nobody can attack her. She's entirely safe in the wilderness. So why is she the one who, um, to whom all these stories are attached by later, by later tradition? So, and I think, um, to understand what's going on, we have to understand um, that um, obviously the early sutta is extremely challenging for the later tradition because in the early sutta, Upalavana declares how independent she is, how she doesn't have to fear any man, how she is strong and powerful and how she has authority and the psychic powers. And that means no man can have any kind of control over her. And that's of course hugely challenging for the later tradition where uh, the monk Sangha is uh, in a position where they, uh, where they exert power over the bhikkhunis and where they exert control over the bhikkhunis in various ways and where they want to um, make it very clear that there, that there is no gender equality, but there is a hierarchy in the Sangha. And um, so a nun who declares her independence and who says that no man can, can do anything to her is of course a problem for later tradition. So by imposing these wilderness rules, you, you have to attach them to Upalavana. It doesn't make sense to attach them to anyone else because Upalavana is the most powerful bhikkhuni. So she is the one, the foremost in psychic powers. And by attaching this story to her, what you're showing basically is that no matter how powerful, how accomplished you are as a bhikkhuni, um, because you're a woman, even the most random guy can come and attack you. So in these stories, it's not like there's a highly accomplished person, man, who comes and attacks Upalavana. It's not that the person also has psychic powers. It's not like they are very strong or in any other way um, extraordinary. It's like the most random guy comes and overpowers Upalavana. And by showing that even the most powerful bhikkhuni can be overpowered by the most random guy, that doesn't leave any wiggle room for any other bhikkhuni to question these rules. Because obviously, like it's, it's very easy to come up with, um, with reasons why the wilderness rules shouldn't apply to a certain person or to a certain group. For example, you could say um, it shouldn't apply if the wilderness is reasonably safe, or it shouldn't apply if, to, to older bhikkhunis because they're no, longer in, they're no longer sexually attractive, or it shouldn't apply to people who are ugly, or it shouldn't apply to uh, women who are very strong and, and physically capable to deal with men. Um, so there could be a lot of reasons why bhikkhunis could question these rules. Um, but if, even, if you show that even the most powerful nun is not able to deal with a single man, um, then there is no wiggle room for any, for any other bhikkhuni because no bhikkhuni can compare herself to Upalavana. So that's why it has to be Upalavana who is um, put into all these stories um, to stop questioning the... Um, yeah, the dominance of the male Sangha. And um, finally, before we wrap up, I would like to show you the rest of the wilderness rules. Um, and I think they show a similar tendency. So first of all, like these are wilderness rules that don't deal with Upalavana. These are from other traditions. Um, and in the Pali, we have the rule here in the Bhikkhuni Kandaka as well. Uh, and as I mentioned, it couldn't be attached 
in the, in the Vinaya itself, it couldn't be attached to Upalavana um, because the Upalavana story was in the, in the Bhikkhu part of the Vinaya. But as we have seen in the commentarial story that we read in the beginning, uh, the, com the commentaries then say that this rule was laid down uh, like in relation to uh, what happened to Upalavana. Um, but in, in the in the Vinaya itself, the story is, is very brief and there is not much background. It's just um, at that time, the nuns were living in the wilderness, scoundrels raped them. They told the Buddha and he said, a nun should not live in the wilderness. If she does, she commits an offense of wrong conduct. Uh, and very similar, the same story is in the Chinese Dharma Guptaka uh, Kandaka. And um, as we have seen just now, the Chinese Dharma Guptaka Kandaka also has the story about Upalavana. So the same rule is laid down twice. Um, about not staying in the wilderness. And that's uh, obviously a telltale sign that there was a corruption uh, in the text, because usually if a rule is laid down and somebody breaks it, the Buddha would say, well, deal with her in accordance with the rule, so make a confession or whatever the rule requires to clear the offense, but he wouldn't lay down the rule again. So, um, yeah, so the way it appears here in the Chinese Dhamma Kuptika doesn't really make too much sense. Um, on the other hand, this is something that is very common in the Chinese Dharma Guptaka tradition. Uh, many, many, many rules are redu reduplicated. And I think the reason for that is very likely that they had two manuscripts that, like it seems to me, they had two manuscripts. They were slightly different. They didn't know which one was the most authentic one. So they merged the two. And that's why so many rules there um, are there twice. But also the Chinese version is very brief very similar to the Pali as usual. Then the bhikkhunis stayed in the wilderness. At a later time, problems arose in the wilderness. The bhikkhus told the Buddha and the Buddha said, bhikkhunis should not stay in the wilderness. Uh, so there's nothing special here actually, um, but this last, the last text uh, here is a text that again is very interesting. This one is from the, a tradition called the Mahasangika. The Mahasangikas are the school that split off from the other schools first. So the result of the first split. Um, so this, this should be the texts that are the most removed from all the other traditions. Um, and we have, and the Mahasangika has a branch school or sub-school called the Lukutaravada. Uh, and so this, this same text is preserved in Chinese and Sanskrit, but because um, both of the texts are really, really similar, I didn't want to put it here twice. So we are reading from the Chinese version here. Um, and the, the Buddha was staying at Savati. At that time, the precept about Bikunis and the wilderness had not yet been laid down. There was no accommodation in villages yet. Then 500 Bikunis with Mahapajapati as their leader were staying in the King's Park. So again, here we see the reference to the King's Park Monastery for Bikunis in a totally different tradition. The Mahasangika is very different from uh, the Savasivala tradition that we read before. The women from Sakyan and Malian families were young and graceful. Some young men waited for them at the beginning of the night and wanted to get hold of the Bikunis. Having seen them, the Bikunis rose up in the air and left. So that means they had uh, deep samadhi, profound attainments, and also the psychic powers here because they could fly away. In the middle of the night, the young men came back again and the Bikunis did the same thing again. At the end of the night, they came again. Among the Bikunis were some with dull faculties who had not entered concentration and were sleeping. So they then didn't manage to leave and were raped. Mahapajapati went to the world honored one and informed him of this matter. The Buddha said, from now on, it is no longer allowed for Bikunis to stay in the wilderness. If the four assemblies gather throughout the night to hear the Dhamma, she's allowed to stay. At that time, she may not be in a secluded place. If a bikuni stays in the wilderness, she breaks a minor vineyard rule. This is called the rules on the wilderness. So here we see it's not Upalavana who is um, in the story. Instead, it's Mahapajapati. Um, but I think it serves a very similar pur uh, purpose because obviously Mahapajapati is also a very, very highly accomplished nun. Um, all the traditions preserve stories about her psychic powers. Um, and also she's the leader of the Bikuni Sangha, so it serves the same purpose. If Mahapajapati isn't safe, then nobody is safe. And here again, we see the Bikunis had psychic powers 
and there were 500 of them. So this story tells us that highly accomplished bhikkhunis, uh, together with Mahapajapati, who had psychic powers and who were in a really, really large group, were not able to defend themselves against a much smaller group of like real, like random guys who, who didn't have any special attainments or didn't have any special accomplishments or any weapons or anything. So again, we, the story serves the same purpose to show us no matter how, how big your group is, no matter how accomplished you are, as a woman, you cannot be safe, you cannot, um, like the most accomplished woman is not able uh, to, um, to, protect, to protect herself against the most random guy. So that clearly puts uh, Bikunis in their place. Uh, and um, the most accomplished woman isn't uh, able to compete with the most random guy. So um, the, um, the gender uh, differences here are really put in the foreground. And um, even though Upalavana isn't in the story, I think the story um, was written with the same intention. So um, this is all I have prepared for today. Um, I hope it was uh, beneficial for you. I hope you gained some insight in how the early text and the later text developed. Uh, to recap what we did today, we looked at the early sutta in which the nuns' own voices are preserved, where their own testimony is given, and where they say that they, um, they, they're happy to dwell in the wilderness, they are confident, they're powerful, they are autonomous, they don't rely on others, they don't need to rely on others. And that was completely turned upside down by the text of the later tradition. So um, that's all for today. And if you have any questions or comments, then now would be a good time to ask. Esther, yeah? Yeah, maybe it's dull, but it comes to mind. Um, what purpose should the later bhikkhus uh, have uh, to be so malicious against bhikkhunis? I, th I think um, not malicious, but it's a problem for the later tradition uh, when, you, when you have such strong independent nuns who are not, not submissive to the monks in a system where the two sanghas are not um, equal, where, where you really need the, the where, like you need the bhikkhunis to submit to the bhikkhus and where you need them to keep the Garudamas and where you need them to, um, to not challenge uh, the, hier the, the hierarchies as they are imposed at a later time. Um, so I, I don't think it's, necessarily malicious, but um, obviously the early stories are very, very challenging to the status quo of the, the later tradition. And we, we've seen like in the last few um, sessions that we have looked at how the position of women um, is no longer equal to men, how there is a, a large gender, like a, a growing gender discrimination over time. And also I think the society expected the bhikkhus to be the guardians of the bhikkhunis. So bhikkhunis, like women were no longer able to be independent agents uh, on their own. They had to be um, in, like women were defined at a later time in relationship to a man, like to their husband or to their father. And as bhikkhunis then in relationship to the bhikkhu sangha as their guardians. So, um, so, that requires a certain hierarchy between the sanghas. And I mean, probably there was also a concern for the bhikkhunis. Like when the bhikkhus feel responsible for the bhikkhunis, then it's much easier for them if they stay in the villages because then nothing can, like there's much less likely that something would happen to them. Um, but that ob obviously also really restricts the ability of bhikkhunis to practice properly. And, um, yeah, I had another thought just now, but it has escaped me now. I hope it's coming back. Ah, yes. And the other thing, as I mentioned, when I explained about the Andavana, um, the bhikkhus also have, have, um, have uh, advantages 
if the status of the nuns is reduced, like there's more prestige, there's a higher status of them, they get more support, they got, get more recognition, and also they get access to all the, the nice properties that previously belonged to the nuns, such as the Andavana. So I think there was like a, a sort of very conflicting mishmash of things going on. Um, on the one hand, they were trying to be compassionate, trying to keep the nuns safe, um, but not letting the nuns make, it, make their own decisions about their own safety, about their own bodies, about what is uh, appropriate for them, about what they feel, how they can keep themselves safe. So it's imposed from outside how they need to keep themselves safe. Um, but probably with a compassionate intention, but on the other side, also there are obviously certain incentives uh, for making sure that the monks and the nuns aren't equal. And I mean, we see that we see that until nowadays that like the, there's a huge, huge difference in respect and recognition between uh, what is given to the monk sangha and what is given to the nun sangha, and how that impacts the ability of women to practice. Like there's so many women who don't find places to stay because everybody just builds monasteries for monks, and even if monasteries for nuns are built, then it's really, really hard for them to survive because they don't get donations, and because the conditions they live in, they are so cramped all together, all bunched together, so there's no possibility to practice in seclusion, so it's like even nowadays, it's so much more difficult for Bikunis uh, because of texts like this um, that, um, yeah, that, you know, show that Bikunis aren't equal to the monks, and of course, if you have those texts, then of course, like, if you're a late person and you want to make the most merit, it's logical that you give to the monks, because that, like, if they, if they have a higher status, then you make more merit there, but that's not at all how it was done in the early Sangha. That's what I'm trying to show. Yeah. Please, Svanchi, uh, yes, please go ahead. Hi, um, Cindy, call me Cindy. Hi, Cindy, everyone. okay. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I've come to um, your talks, but... Uh, it's because of timing and other stuff, I'm always a little bit late, so I apologize for that. Um, but thank you um, for all your talks. It's uh, eye-opening. Um, I'm still very new uh, learning about Buddhism, but um, yeah, it's a little bit shocking, to be honest, <laughs> hearing about a lot of things, which uh, I guess, yeah, we, we don't know the story behind the stories. Um, but what I wanted to ask was, um, historically, um, so what do we know about the, the, the time of the Buddha and, and the, the, the Terries uh, when they were around? What was it about their society that made it possible for the Terries to, to thrive and, 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 and um, uh, you know, be in that? What was it that allowed that to happen, which subsequently declined? Mm. Do we know much about that? Yeah, so, so it, it seems that, um, you know, of, of course, the Sangha isn't completely independent from the society at large. The Buddha set up the Sangha to be very much interdependent with the society and very much rely on lay support also. So in, to some extent, the Sangha also has to adapt to changing values in society. So, um, and when uh, values change in society, usually what changes first is the, the um, ability of women uh, to, to be independent or to be um, under the authority of others. So the status of women is something that has historically changed over time very often. And it seems that in the Buddha's time, um, society was pretty open-minded. Uh, I think we've talked about this also in, in previous sessions already. So there was, uh, we see in the early text, there was a strong expectation that a teaching should, um, a teaching that is well explained, a good Dhamma, should um, be um, catering towards both men and women. So there was an expectation of gender equality in religious practice. There was an expectation that any um, good spiritual teacher would set up a male sangha and a female sangha and would give opportunities for all genders. Um, and yeah, it, it, to me, it seems that um, society changed to some extent, and um, like we know in the Buddha's time, there also were a lot of female sanghas in other, in other non-Buddhist movements, like the Jain female sangha, 
There were Ajivikas, there were female Brahmin practitioners, there were female wanderers, they were just completely independent. I didn't have any affiliation with any, any kind of movement. But that seems to have changed in the um, decades or centuries after the Buddha in society seems to have changed. Um, and also one other thing that we've talked about in our first session also, I think, is that um, there were also different tendencies in the Sangha, different groups. The Sangha wasn't one homogenous block. So some people uh, were kind of opposed to Bikunis, some, some monks. And that's kind of understandable if you if you like if you see this in, in terms of the practice where people have to keep celibacy and where the um, the social norms are such that like um, heteronormative practices are, are the ones that that are like encouraged or that that uh, people um, subscribe to. So as a monk who has to keep celibacy, uh, usually. And if you struggle with that, if you're not an arahant yet, then you have to keep away from women and women are tempting you and you have to be very careful around women. So there was a temp like that. It's very easy then to to demonize the female female Sangha because they are always tempting you and are always um, um, challenging you and, and threatening also your monastic life. Because if you give in to to those tendencies, of course, as I mentioned, Parajika one, you have to disrobe immediately. So in that way, like for a celibate movement, it's very easy to demonize the female side. So I think many, many things came together. Anna-Marie, go ahead, please. Thank you. I have so much. Um, I'm, I'm really inspired. It just makes so much sense. Um, what you're sharing today, like for the early, the only early text that we have, if I understand it correctly, like the only early text that we have on the subject to be one of, you know, this is the, this is the practice that leads to overcoming all fear, including this one, mm. and that everything else to be, um, yeah, what, 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 what we were, what Esther was talking about earlier as well, but it's, it's not just something that like nowadays that's visible in the Sangha, but like I think in wider society, like the like a symptom of patriarchy or or any sort of demographic that's in in charge or that has the power will be threatened by uh, whether it's based on gender or skin color or anything will be threatened by other groups and that to sort of have crept into the later um, text that I, yeah, just I'm still processing it, but it all seems to make a lot of sense. Mm. So thank you very much. Tracy, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciated this as well. Um, I'm curious. I think that the point you make about um, the wilderness rule being a way um, that prop like to justify the seizure of like the nun's property. I mean. That's like putting it in one, um, maybe that's not exactly what happened, but that it justifies um, the fact that, you know, the, the Bikuni Sangha no longer had um, possession of these properties that they did in the Buddhist time. I'm curious, like, does the Vinaya like talk about administration of property at all? Um. The nuns vineyard doesn't really, I mean, well, to some extent it did, like it doesn't go into much detail, but it's kind of implicit that the properties were managed. Like you have various Sangha officials for the various um, duties that are associated with property management, such as building projects or um, repairs and things like that. And then we have references to um, um, kind of monastery workers, like lay people who lived in the monastery to provide whatever services were necessary and also maintain the property and did things that the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis couldn't do, such as like um, pruning trees or maintaining um, whatever the, the path is and digging in the ground and doing like whatever um, property management um, things were necessary. 
So in that sense, um, yeah, there are references in the vineyard. On the other hand, also um, very often the person who donated the land, they would feel responsible and they would also often provide workers and, and uh, you know, do what, whatever is necessary there. So I think it's not fully clear to what extent the Sangha did that themselves and to what extent um, the, the original donors or other lay people would, would do that. And also a wilderness property doesn't really need that much um, management in the first place, I think. Thank you. Okay, so I just wanted to check in with you again. Last time we discussed um, uh, whether or not people would be interested to have a special ses session about Bikuni Vinaya, um, especially about Sikamana training and about the ordination rules. So I just wanted to see if people are still interested. If you're interested, we can do it next week. But if not, we can also skip it. So can you raise your hand if you're interested? Do I have a yeah, okay. Four people, five. Okay, most people are interested. So then next week we will talk about Bikuni Vinaya and uh, push everything back one week. So let me see. Did I prepare? Can you? Uh, I think I prepared the new course outline. Oh no, what happened? Mm. Yeah. Oops. Sorry about that. So um, today we did the session on Palavana. Next week we are going to do the Bikuni Vinaya and Sikamanas. Then we're going to have everything that we were planning to have one week later. And I cancelled the session on Sela. Um, so in total we're still having 12 sessions as before because I've left one out. And we were also thinking about having one bonus session about uh, the Seven Sisters stories. Um, yeah, I haven't decided yet if we are going to do that and when, like if we do it, then when we would do it. So we'll have to see how it goes. And I think we can discuss it again in a few weeks uh, to see if people are still interested in that later. So are there any other questions that have come up so far? No? Um, uh, Esther, uh, Esther, I remember last time you had a question about Rahula and the Seven Sisters. Uh, and you asked if Rahula uh, was one of the brothers of the Seven Sisters, the one of the sons of King Kiki. And I looked it up in the commentaries and uh, according to some commentaries, yes, he was the eldest son of King Kiki and he took over the, the kingdom from King Kiki when King Kiki um, passed away. But according to other commentaries, it wasn't Rahula, it was another monk called Ratapala. And the reason for the confusion seems to be that uh, 100,000 eons ago, under Padumutada uh, Buddha's time, um, Rahula and Ratapala were two brothers and they made marriage together. And then their fate became intertwined. And that's why they very, very often were born together. And that's why apparently the commentary made this confusion and it's not quite clear which of the two was the son of King Kiki. Um, and also in Upalavana's Apadana stories, uh, she says that she was very, very often reborn together with Rahula. So their fate was also intertwined for a very long time. So in, in, like, in that sense, it makes sense that it should be Rahula and it should not be Ratapala because obviously Upalavana is one of the seven sisters. Uh, so it would be her brother, Rahula would be her brother in that case. Um, but yeah, the tradition isn't fully clear. So to answer your question, it's not clear. Yeah. Okay, I think if there are no other questions, then we will end uh, with three sadhu. And I will see you all next week. Sadhu, 
Sadhu, Sadhu.